skill that wants to work for a, uh, a startup. So uh, Peter, Jacob, please put that in there. Okay, so we're gonna get started now. Um, we're, we're very lucky to have uh, David Sefcik um, join us tonight. Uh, he is the uh, founder of Mac and Noodles, a food truck serving gourmet mac and cheese throughout Denver. Um, his uh, uh, prior partner, Tony Fischels, did I say that right, Tony? And if I butchered it, I apologize. You did. You're one of few that get it, gets it right the first time, so. So Tony is the one that actually put this together. He's in the MBA program. And uh, the two of them are, were awesome to offer their time tonight. And they're, they're going to walk us through the early years about um, what it takes to start a, a food truck and you know, the economics of a food truck business. And like everything else, um, as we go through this, put uh, questions in the chat because I'll, I'll, uh, I'll interview and ask questions for about 35 minutes. And then what makes this even more exciting is students with your questions. So make sure to fill those up in the chat. And when, it, um, when we're answering those questions, Oliver will, uh, um, from Do You, will uh, be asking the questions. So we'll, we'll get rolling. Um, first of all, uh, let me just pull up my notes here. So David, the, the first question, you know, and I think the food truck business is just fascinating in terms of what it is, how it works. Um, I don't understand the economics of it. I'm excited to have you step us through this, but why did you start a food truck? Is your background rooted in the restaurant business? Will you walk us through how you started it, why you started it? Yeah, so um, my, I was growing up, I always wanted to ha have a restaurant. My uncles were franchisees at the Pizza Ranch back in Iowa. Um, and then as I was in college at Iowa State, they have uh, got into Moe's, Southwestern Mex, and they've just started other kind of food operations um, before, you know, taking a step back and, and kind of retiring from them. Uh, but I always, I always thought their lifestyle looked fun and creative, and um, I was wrong. Um, it's, it's hard, but it's, it is a lot of fun. Um, and so um, I went to Iowa State University. I got a graduate, or I got a degree in hospitality management. Um, and uh, the one thing I, I learned is that, you know, while they, they teach you some of the food safety and standards, um, running a food service business is, is a lot different on the grounds of doing it. Um, and so, you know, I, I think Tony will agree when we started, we didn't have any clue of what we were doing. Um, and, you know, some things went, went well, some things we, we made mistakes that we could have known better on, but uh, that's kind of where it started from just watching my uncles. And, um, and so we got into the food truck because a, a brick and mortar restaurant is just so much more expensive to start. And being, you know, a 25 year old at the time with student loans, nobody's going to loan you, you know, half a million dollars on a thought with when you have no experience. Um, so that's how the food truck came to be instead of the restaurant. So had, had you worked in a restaurant? Had you been a bus boy? Had you been a waiter? Had you anything like that? I was a delivery driver for Papa John's um, and Pizza Pit in Ames, Iowa. And that was the extent of, of my experience. So, okay. All right. So you're 25. You've got the Papa John's background. You've got the Iowa State degree. You've got you're you're out of you're out of college, and you want to start this food truck. What did you do? What was the research work that was required? Obviously, you know you didn't have the cash for brick and mortar. You said food truck. What was the next step? The uh, the next thing we did is we spent probably six months trying to design a cheese sauce recipe, um, and learning what a bechamel was, which seems like common sense now, but um, at the time, you know, you have to learn like what does salt do and how does salt um, affect your food. Um, and so without, you know, much prior experience, we, uh, you know, we, we went to Google and we just looked up a lot of different recipes. And then we played around with, you know, do we want whole percent, whole milk, 1%, 2%? Do we want sharp cheddar? Do we want mild cheddar? You know, do we want Gouda? Do we want these other types? Um, and we kind of designed a recipe that we thought would work. Um, and then we just tested it and ate more mac and cheese than we ever wanted to. Um, and at that point, then I went, we went back to like our families and we would try it and test it. Uh, but that was, that was about all the research we did. Uh, we didn't really truly look into the food truck business itself or, you know, where we were going to park, what we were going to do. Um, all we did was just try and find a recipe. And once we had a recipe, um, we went and we bought the truck. And a few months later, we just started buying meters downtown um, and, until we found spots to be. But uh, I, I can't really say we did much more uh, research than um, just recipes on Google and then having people taste test for us. Okay, so uh, two questions here. 
you felt like if you um, got the recipe right, you would have success is what I'm hearing. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. I mean, the biggest thing is, you know, we were, we were young, we had no, no family, no commitments. We had all the time in the world. Um, but we knew if we didn't have a good product, it didn't really matter how much time we had. Um, so the first thing was just try and get a good product, make sure people are going to like it, you know, try and get it consistent. And then, you know, now let's go try and sell it. Um, and so that was our, our rationale. So what was, uh, how did you validate it? I mean, you probably obviously use friends and family, but what if they all have bad taste in food? Yeah, that was, that was a gamble we took. Um, we, uh, I, uh, I used to work at a law firm downtown. And so I taste tested it for the office one day. We did a mac and cheese day where we brought it in. Um, and, you know, they had, they had good things to say about it. We did it in crock pots and then served everyone. And, um, you know, that was, that was it. Um, it was just kind of a gamble, a whim. Um, probably wasn't the most traditional way of starting, but, you know, we had a lot of energy and excitement and um, we weren't gonna, we weren't gonna let any, you know, lack of experience stop us. And Tony, feel free to jump in too at any point in time if you want to say anything or, or elaborate on anything. Um, yeah, for sure. And I think, uh, you know, as we said, we had friends um, try it out too. I think one of them was like during the Super Bowl, we had quite a few people over to try it out. Um, there were quite a few, few events um, after the fact too, even after we started, um, we were part of the trout tank. Um, through the, uh, I think it's through the Chamber of Commerce or some sort of Denver entity. So we ended up uh, working through them too. We were a finalist for it, which was a lot of fun. So we actually got people's opinion there too, so. Nice. So why did you choose mac and cheese? Personal passion, favorite dish? No, actually growing up, I hated mac and cheese. Um, my, it was my brother's favorite food. Um, but we, I was working for a company called Noon. It's a hydration company and we were doing the Ragnar Relay. And so um, we were up in Copper Mountain and they had a restaurant called Copper's Red Hot. And they had, uh, it was kind of like an American style restaurant where they had hot dogs, burgers, and they had four different styles of mac and cheese. Um, and I remember, you know, it, it was probably three days after the event ended. I, I called Tony and I was like, I had this idea, like if, and, and the words were, if Chipotle can take the burrito out of a Mexican restaurant and make a concept out of it, why can't someone take mac and cheese out of a menu and make a concept straight around mac and cheese? Um, and then we started Googling it and we, you know, we couldn't find any purely mac and cheese restaurants in, in, uh, in Denver. You know, we, later there's one we found in, uh, over by Morrison, somewhere in the mountains. Um, but uh, for, for the most part, it was an untouched market where not many people were doing and we thought, you know, it kind of, could kind of be that next catchy creative idea. You want to add on to that, Tony, at all? I don't have much to add on to it. I actually kind of forgot about uh, uh, when David approached me and that was that was spot on. So, um, yeah, for myself and another partner we had, I think we'd been talking before where we all wanted to start something, um, you know, eventually not work a nine to five job. Um, and David found an opportunity and it looked like a good way for the three of us to start, start something. So that's kind of how it started really. All right. So for our entrepreneurs out there, you know, they, 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 they found kind of, uh, an opportunity. They, uh, they validated it with, it, they started finding product fit. And then will you walk us through the startup cost? You know, um, when you, when you are, pardon me, let me, let me back up. How do you, how do you price your, your meals? And so in terms of when you look at um, what that final price is, and let's say it's $12 for a bowl of mac and cheese, and I don't know what the price is, but how do you, how do food trucks price it? And how, how is that different than a brick and mortar? So we, we, uh, we spoke with my uncles and tried to find out their food costs from the corporate uh, chain of Pizza Ranch. Um, and they were telling us, you know, roughly, Try and you know your food costs are going to be 25% of, of what you sell it for. Um, so when we added up the cost of the cheese and all the ingredients, and then portioned out how much meat or vegetables went into each dish, you know times it by four, and that's what we were trying to hit. Um, for the most part, you know some of the, some of them are a little above, some of them are a little below. Um, but you know we charge $10 a mac and cheese right now. It's a 20 ounce bowl, um, and so that's our our goal has always been you know keep around 20 25%. 
Um, and then you also got to factor in um, the food trucks. I feel like the food trucks have a little bit lower food costs than a brick and mortar, just because our volume isn't quite there compared to how many people they serve versus we serve on an in individual night. Um, and then, you know, the convenience of driving it to everyone, you know, we don't have a delivery fee or a travel fee. Uh, so we have to recoup that into the food costs as well. So, um, you know, if we can hit 20, 25%, we can have one item on our menu or so that's, you know, 15%. That's usually one of the more popular ones. Um, that's kind of where we figured um, was the best price point. And then um, finally, you know, then we just round to the nearest dollar because, um, you know, you have so much to do when you start a food truck and um, you're trying to be every, you know, facet of the business that you just don't have time to go to the bank and constantly get coins and, and change. So um, the pricing kind of, kind of gradually changed over time with, with, you know, getting rid of the coins and then rounding to the dollar and um, finding ways to, to keep it around 25%. Interesting. So, all right. So you, you figure. So you're saying your food your food costs. So you're are twenty five percent of what you actually charge. So it's so around two two dollars and fifty cents. Correct. Yep. That's right. it. Um. So in in terms of the startup costs for a, a food truck, what what are those costs? So they've they've changed a lot. Um, when we first started, uh, we met this builder in Denver out on uh, Brighton Road. Um, surprisingly, we, we found him on Facebook, or not, on Craigslist. And Tony and I walked into a shop in December or November of 2015. And uh, he sat us down and he told us he was going to build us a truck out and put all the gas, the water, the, the piping into it. Um, and this is 2015. And he was gonna do it for about 38,000, if that's right, Tony, that sounds about right. Yeah, I was gonna say around 40,000. And then so that sounds that, right. so about about thirty eight and so that was our first our first truck. Um, now um, that guy is actually uh, indicted by the state and you know he's he's in jail. Um, so he he scored scored a lot of corners and just didn't didn't do it the right way. Um, right now you're probably looking at 65, 70, 75 just for the build out and that's not going to include any of the you know the pots and the pans, the spatulas, the wrap, the generator. Um, you know, if you're going to get a trailer or a, or a truck, you're probably looking around 70. Um, so you got to look at not only what kind of truck you're using, is it an old one, is it a new one, um, or what kind of a trailer, and then build on top of that, the you know, the supplies to build it out with the framing and the piping and the electrical and all the other aspects that go into the food truck. So what are you all in on a food truck? So if, if I was going to go start one today, I come up with a concept and I, I go buy one. I don't need a trailer. I'm not smoking anything. What are my costs? If you're going to, if you're going to go, it's different. So if you go with a, a second generation one, so someone who's went out of business, you can usually get theirs for 40, 45. Um, but if you're going to custom build your own, you're probably looking for the truck. Uh, you're looking at 15, 20, um, and that's going to be an older truck with 150, 200,000 miles on it. It's probably not going to be diesel. If you go diesel, you're looking at 25,000. Um, and then probably another 60,000 to frame it, install the electrical, gas, and plumbing as well. Wow, and what is the time frame to, to build that out? If uh, in the winter, usually about six weeks. If you go during the heavy time uh, when everyone's starting to do it, so early spring, middle of summer, you could be looking at up to three, four months. Interesting. Uh, audience, please throw uh, um, questions in the chat and we'll get those at about in about 15 minutes. So uh, uh, any questions you have for uh, David or Tony. Um, so when you were retrofitting and building out your truck, what are the things that you needed to think about with design in terms of the number of people in there, the um, access to different cutlery pans? What, how did you think about it? Uh, so that was a, a major learning curve from the first one to the second one. Um, for the first one, we kind of thought about what we might need to cook it. Um, and you learn a lot after your first one. So we put in a bunch of equipment we did not need and we didn't make it very functional. You know, the, the setup doesn't really make a whole lot of sense right now. Um, but we were kind of trying to sit down and think about, you know, um, you know, we, we have a box truck. So we have 16 feet of cooking space, uh, eight feet wide, uh, 16 long. And then you have to measure out how long is your sandwich prep? You know, we went with the 60 inch sandwich prep. So that gave us 13 more feet or 11 more feet. Um, and then, so we had to put the burners, the oven, the fryer, a table, a freezer, a uh, refrigerator, and then shelving in there. And so we took, you know, we went on a piece of paper with the guy who was building it and he just drew it in front of us. We're like, here's all the equipment we need. 
you know, how are we going to fit it in there? And then you, we kind of went down and, you know, what was our most important, you know, we wanted the long sandwich prep. So we went 60 inch sandwich prep. Um, but then that only gave us about uh, four feet for burners. Um, and then we had a two foot uh, flat top with an oven, the fryer is 18 inches. And so you really start, you know, you add in what's most important and then you kind of go from there and you, you add up how many inches you're at. And then you just draw it on a piece of paper and, and hope that, you know, we hope that our, our workflow was, was accurate at the time. Um, but, you know, that's things I would look differently at at the time. I just didn't know them when we went through it. What was the biggest mistake you made? Buying a truck. That was by far the biggest mistake. I would uh, highly recommend a trailer for anyone who's going a food, food truck in the, past, in the future. How come? The, uh, so when a, when a truck breaks down, um, not only are you paying for the repairs, but you're down. Um, these trucks, they're, they're old vehicles. Uh, they're high mileage. Um, there's not a whole lot of dealerships that'll work on them or mechanics anymore. And so the ones that do are a little shadier. Um, so you don't quite get the best work all the time. Um, I was actually trying to fix a um, uh, the pump module on the, the brake lines. And so I was going to John Elway Chevrolet and it's a Chevrolet workhorse. Um, but because these tr trucks have so many issues, not even John Elway Chevrolet will work on these trucks anymore. Um, so now you have the high cost, you know, it's, you know, anything that happens on a car, um, times it by five. And that's what you're looking at, at a, at a truck, you know, it's a $3,000 fuel pump. It's not just a, a $600 pump, um, plus labor. And so the costs really add up. And so, you know, a small repair can be two to $3,000 and trying to find someone to work on it. You're down three to four days. So you have no revenue. You're out $3,000, um, on a truck. You can go to any enterprise, any um, car rental place, and you can rent a four two fifty for you know seventy five bucks a day, and you're still in business to cover those costs because um, the trailer doesn't break down, just the engine of the vehicle. Interesting. Um, okay, so I want to uh, switch gears now and talk a little bit more about talk about strategy. So what is, and you mentioned this a little bit at the very beginning, talked about meters. So what's the strategy around truck placement in terms of, I see them at breweries, I see them downtown, I see them at festivals. Where is the best place and optimal place to maximize profit? And uh, also are there regulations to consider based on where you, you park? Yeah, so every city is different. Um, you know, Denver has to have go through a fire inspection and a health inspection. Um, there's two licenses that you need. You need a health license from any county and Denver. So Denver does not reciprocate any county's health license, but every county that is not Denver reciprocates any other county's license. Um, and so you have to figure out what county you're going to get licensed in and Denver if you want to operate in Denver. Um, and then each city is a little different. So if you talk like Superior um, or Lafayette, I don't remember which one, they don't allow a food truck to be in one spot for more than 15 minutes. So if the cops catch you there for more than 15 minutes, they shut you down on the spot um, and you're just gone. You have to leave or they'll find you um, and they're not going to let you open anyways. Whereas like uh, Westminster, Littleton, um, Lone Tree, Highlands Ranch, uh, Castle Rock, they're all different. You can kind of park wherever you want. Um, the best places are not in the public right away. And what I mean by that is like the street at meters. Um, the best places are usually private property, neighborhoods, HOAs, schools, uh, you know, places where you're not on the road. Um, and so when we, when we first started, our goal was to win Denver. Um, and we wanted to be, you know, the biggest food truck in Denver. And, um, and so that meant a lot of times we'd be in Highlands or Rhino. Um, and when we, over time, we kind of learned Denver is not really the optimal place to be. Uh, if you follow the 470 loop in the Northwest Parkway, kind of around there, uh, the suburbs is, is where you want to be. And uh, in Denver, a lot of times, you know, you're dealing with a younger clientele, um, you know, probably 18 to 35 for the most part, um, it seems like in the places you go, and especially the breweries, um, you know, when, when people who are just out of college or in college, they go to a brewery, a lot of times they sit down and everyone will get a beer, um, but they might split an entree. You go to the suburbs and you're in Highlands Ranch of Lone Tree and mom, dad, kid, you know, five-year-old, doesn't matter how old they are, they all get their own entree. So, you know, instead of having three people split a $10 entree, now you have four people buying a $10 entree each. So um, over time, we kind of found out the suburbs are where we want to be and we don't really want to spend any time in Denver 
um, too much anymore. You know, we still go to Denver, just it's uh, it's maybe once a month instead of you know three four times a week. What about what about festivals? I mean, obviously post COVID or pre COVID. Yeah, so so festivals are tricky. Um, you know, you can you can do very very well at a festival. Um, it's kind of a pay to play model, so it's it's hard when you're starting. Um, there's uh, like we do Global Music Dance Festival at the Sports Authority Field, and they charge us, I believe it was eighteen hundred dollars for two days. So we're paying nine hundred dollars a day to be there. Uh, we went to Warp Tour uh, when that was a uh, going on at the Pepsi Center, and that was a thousand dollars a day. Um, and and so it's you got to be careful because the festivals have a, a very large price to be there. And if they're not a captive audience, if that price is that high, you'll never make your money back. So Taste of Colorado, um, you'll never make any money at Taste of Colorado. You're gonna you're gonna lose money left and right. Um, it's it's very hard as a food truck. You know the, the tent booths usually are more successful than the trucks, um, just because they're more open air and the cooking people can see everything. Um, but the uh, the festivals, it, it's got to be very careful because a lot of them don't really care if the trucks make money, and they're just gonna throw out a price and you know. Next thing you know, you're two and a half thousand dollars into a weekend just to be there. Then you got to include food, labor, and everything on top of that, and uh, it's not very um, successful. But um, you know, that's not to say there can't. There's some great ones out there for food trucks. Anything with botanical gardens is great. Um, we do a lot of city festivals, like so. I guess the the cities and the suburbs, um, their festivals, their Fourth of Julys, those are a lot more successful, and they're usually a lot more reasonable than your Taste of Colorado, your Cherry Creek Arts Festival, your uh, Warp Tour, your uh, Riot Fest, your uh, Grand Doozy was a fun one. Um, so you just gotta be careful on those. So speaking of that, and the, take out the cost of the festival, obviously, um, you, like the mile high one you, at 1800, you gotta sell 90, what, 90 bowls a day just to, to pay for that piece. But yep. um, when you thought about how, when you went into an event or out to the suburbs, how many bowls of Mac do you have to make to, uh, to sell to make a profit? What was your goal? What's your goal every day? My goal right now is uh, in the winter right now, we're happy at 80, 80 Mac and cheeses a day. If we can do that, we're ecstatic, you know, to cover our costs. If we can cover, if we can make 50 bowls of Mac and cheese a day, you know, we've covered our costs. And that by cost, I mean gas, propane, insurance, rent, labor, food, um, anything more than 50, I'd say we start earning a profit. Okay, that makes sense. And one thing I didn't cover earlier is how is it prepared? Do you make everything in the food truck? So you roll up and you start boiling water for the noodles and start making your bechamel? So we, uh, we use a co-producer now out of Denver. Um, Tico's Foods is who we use and they make our cheese sauce. Uh, it, Making a cheese sauce is very hard at, uh, when you're doing a five gallon stock pot because you don't have the right equipment. You want more of a steam jacket kettle where the heat is even throughout. Um, in the truck, you're a direct heat on a burner. And so it goes directly on the bottom and you tend to burn that cheese sauce. And then it tastes like a cigarette and sometimes you don't catch it and you piss a lot of people off. Um, and that was, that was a learning curve. So um, we, uh, we start, you know, we pre-boil our noodles or parboil them. And then we have a boiling pot of water on the truck where we have a strainer and we dip the noodles in for about 20 seconds. And then we bring them up, strain them and throw them into a pot of cheese sauce. Um, right now our cheese sauce, they, they make our recipe and they put it in boil bags. And then, so we just, we have a plastic bag that everything's already, you know, it's already been made. It's been, it's been chilled down to health code. And then we, uh, we heat that up uh, in the boil bag and a pot of water as well. And then we rip open the bag and we put it in a six pan or three pan. And uh, then we, you know, scoop it into the, uh, the saute pan where we toss everything together, mix it and put it into one dish and then pour it into the bowl. So when we, if you're doing everything to order on a food truck, you're, you're just not going to be fast. And, you know, you got to find that balance of, you know, you got to be convenient, but you also have to have better quality food. Um, you know, you can't serve McDonald's quality food and expect people to come up. Um, you have to give them some value for, for their bang or their buck. Um, so. It's about, I'd say when we, when we roll up to the event, everything is already uh, cooked. And then now it's just a, it's a warming process and a, and a plating process. You, do you think that's um, pretty much standard across, around the industry? I mean, obviously different food is you know, prepared differently, but a lot of it's pre-made, pre pre-prepped. 
I do, you know, especially when you look at your barbecue trucks, they're smoking meat for 12 to 18 hours. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if they, the smoke you smell might be them smoking their meat for the next day. It's not what they're going to serve that day, um, especially if it's at night, because, it, you know, when you're looking 12 plus hours to smoke it, um, it's all been done ahead of hand. Um, and then you can bring it up to temperature and then serve it. Um, you just, you don't, you're so low on space that you have to, you have to make, you know, some sacrifices. And I, and I think it, it, uh, it actually does make, you know, for the food truck, it speeds you up, but it also keeps things more consist consistent. Okay. Yeah. And I think, uh, when we first started the truck too, our idea was going to be to make everything on demand. <laughs> and that's probably why we had a lot of things in the truck that we didn't need. And that just wasn't possible. It would have taken way too long. And then even when talking to brick and mortar restaurants, they kind of have the, the prep process too, where they make things ahead of time and then they do like a warming process. Um, so it's not even unusual in the industry, even for some of like the fast casual brick and mortar concepts too. So. Got it. So we're going to switch gears and this is um, something that's very unusual. Um, we're going to talk about partners and uh, you know, David, you, you and Tony were partners at the beginning, then you are now uh, on your own. And you know, one of the things with business, a lot of times and it's, it, it's an unfortunate part of business, you know, biz partnerships are like marriages. Sometimes they're more difficult to break up than marriages and uh, most of them don't end very well. Um, so I'd like you to, to talk about, you know, how, how you went from partners to no partners and, and how, how that worked out. Yeah. So um, we started as, you know, I mean, we, we're pretty good friends um, leading up to it. Um, you know, they say don't go into business with friends and partners um, or friends and family. Um, and, and I can see some of that's true. The, uh, the thing, you know, we started with is, is I don't think, you know, we just, we had, we had different views as everything started to go on. Um, we had a lot of the same goals, but uh, we made, we made some big mistakes. Um, and I'd say some of those mistakes, you know, were, were definitely financially driven. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we took an opportunity in California that, uh, we lost a lot of money on. Um, and we, we went to California and we opened up in the theme park in California's Great America. And uh, we went in there and then we came back to Denver. Our truck was broken. We had brought up, you know, $40,000 in high interest credit card debt. And for a new business who was still learning, uh, it just, it, it put a lot of stress on, on the relationship, similar to how finances can ruin, ruin a marriage too. Um, and, and so, you know, as, as time went on, um, I think we, we realized, you know, we had some different goals. Uh, we had some different th ways of, of doing stuff. And, uh, and it, just, it just came to, you know, a place where we needed to uh, just end things and, and, go, and go from there. Um, but, you know, I mean, part of it was our own, um, how do I say this? Um, we were naive. We didn't quite understand exactly, you know, what we were doing in, going into, we had no experience. And, uh, you know, I think, Tony would agree, you know, going forward, we, we both learned more from that experience than we would, we ever thought we would. Um, so I, I guess, I don't know if you have a specific question or, or anything on that, or Tony can chime in here and, and see if I'm missing anything. Yeah. And I guess as far as we had three partners total, myself, David, and another one. Um, so myself and the other partner, um, we had other full-time jobs, whereas David was working full-time on the restaurant concept that we had, um, Mac and Noodles, um, which makes it really tough. David was doing all the work. Um, you know, our other partner and me, we also weren't taking a paycheck either. Um, and we'd help out when we can, which was not nearly enough, um, if David would probably agree. Um, we did kind of shoot ourselves on the foot by trying to manage another location, not even in Colorado, in California, which is really, really tough. And I would not recommend that if you're looking to grow your business. Um, so when we decided not to continue to grow to other locations, um, you know, the focus was more to grow through food trucks. Um, but with that said, there still wasn't a path to Danny and I 
taking a paycheck in the future or recouping our investment. And there also wasn't a path to either of us working full time because that wouldn't have made sense. So um, I will say if there is a takeaway from this, it will be get in business with the right partners um, or get in business with the right people, especially when things don't go well. Um, realistically, um, you know, the business was kind of failing at the time. Um, David's done a really good job of actually bringing it out of the hole and growing it. Um, but really what could have happened, we could have let it, you know, go away. David could have started something else on his own. He already knew how to start a food truck. He knew the concept, but instead what David did was he took a loan from his parents and actually paid us for our share of the company. So, um, when we talk about integrity and getting in business with the right people, I think it's highly important, especially when things go wrong. Um, and I don't think that always happens. In fact, I, I know that doesn't always happen because I've heard of um, instances similar to where it ruins friendships, it ruins people financially. Um, it's a tough situation. So um, yeah, David's done a, a fantastic job. It just didn't work out for all of us. So that's impressive. That's, that's, a, that's a great story. Um, I have one more question, then we'll open it up. Um, and it's kind of a big question, but I think it's very important when you, you're talking about your growth strategy and you had one truck. And how did you go from one truck to four trucks and also expanding past mac and cheese? What was the decision criteria around that? And uh, how did you fund it? Yeah, so we went, to, um, we went from one mac and noodles to two mac and noodles. Um, and it was just kind of uh, trying to, you know, we had, a, we had a lot of schools we work with um, where we couldn't fulfill multiple requests in the same night. And so we thought it would make sense to add a second mac and noodles truck. Um, but what we learned with adding a second mac and noodles truck is, you know, instead of bringing multiple trucks of different concepts to the events that you already know are successful, you end up having to take a lot of duds again and you kind of learn where you want to go. Um, so the second mac and noodles was not as uh, successful as the first one ended up being. Um, and so that's when we, um, so for the second one, uh, Square offers a loan based on your sales. And so that's how I funded the second one. Um, they then take the cash flow you have each night, uh, debit it, and you gradually pay back based on your sales. Um, and then the third truck was a wrap truck. Uh, it's Capital City Wraps. And we started that one because we were trying to think of you know, what, what would make sense um, to complement Mac and Noodles? You know, we're, we've already done the whole trying to find new events. Um, it's a slow going process. It's harder than, than it was just being one concept. So we went to a second concept and we, uh, and we thought wraps would complement Mac and cheese, you know, a healthy alternative with your unhealthy and your fatty food. Um, and then that one was funded. Uh, I had a condo and I ended up selling it when I got married. Um, and I took the proceeds from selling my condo and I opened up a third truck. Um, and so um, that one, not really traditional bank financing as well. Um, and then the fourth one, uh, so that was the first one we started in 2016. The second Mac and Noodles opened in 2019. Uh, in January of 2020, it was terrible timing for a wrap truck. And uh, we opened it right as the pandemic started. And uh, that one, you know, now that one was on the road. And then the fourth one is the Colorado pig rig and it's uh, it was a barbecue one. And I've gotten to know a lot of different food truckers in the Metro. And so I knew one guy who was um, looking to get out. He wanted to move to Vermont, live on a farm um, and he would finance the truck and himself. And so I found, so I got a deal with him where he would finance it. I'd make him uh, monthly payments until it was paid off. And uh, I intentionally, I didn't actually want to buy it when I approached him. Uh, we had a contract catering FedEx where we were catering, catering them in November and it was, you know, four or 500 meals a night, um, three times a week. And so I just wanted to rent his truck and um, he had talked me into buying it rather than renting it. And so I somehow ended up with a barbecue concept in November. Um, and, and so I'd say, you know, we've, we've looked at, you know, we, we had started with the uh, California adventure in 2016, um, which was just a, a shot through their investor relations website. Um, you never know when they'll actually listen or reply. And then we looked into a brick and mortar in 2018, but that fell through. And so then we did the second food truck. And then after that one fell through, I realized, you know, 
I was fortunate we didn't sign a lease on a brick and mortar because it's expensive. So uh, we then we opened up the third one and then the fourth one kind of just fell in our lap because of a, a FedEx contract. And um, and it's more just being a, I've never had a set idea on, on what to do. It's always kind of been, you know, here we are in the moment, what makes sense, um, what opportunities are out there, and then kind of being willing to change with with what's going on rather than being set on this has to be it, that has to be the way. It's kind of like what what now makes the most sense and going from there. Well, thank you for that. that very interesting. Um, Oliver, I think we have some questions in the chat. Do you want to take over? Yes. Um, so there are three people to ask questions. First, uh, Kim Lambui asked uh, three different questions. Uh, Kim, would you like to read them? If not, I can read them for you. Now have to have the students read them. Okay. The audience. Sure. Um, can you hear me? Yep, sure can. I can read it. I'm not a student. I'm actually another food trucker. And I've, I've heard of Dave's truck. And I just wanted to hear from a veteran because I'm pretty new. Um, but the first question you already answered was, how did you acquire funding for the first truck and then three more? Um, my other questions were, um, the second one is, uh, what changes to your business operations have you had to do um, during COVID to keep your revenue up? Um, did you see a like a hit to your revenue at all, and how did you how did you pivot or or modify in order to keep your revenue up? Yeah, so we're down uh, fifty percent year over year. Um, it's actually been really tough and not fun experience, um, as I think most people in this industry have gone through. Um, the uh, the thing we did is we started, we, you know, we just tried to be on top of the change. Um, what, what truck do you have? Uh, my truck is Miss B's Vietnamese. Oh, I've met you guys. We did a school before up in Arvada together. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, I had your bond me. Um, really? But, uh, I don't yeah. think it's been in Arvada, but it could have been me or another truck. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's taken a big hit. Um, also, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, I started Colorado Food Truck Stops. And so it was kind of, uh, you know, to keep my trucks busy. And then it's kind of steamrolled from there um, where we started managing a lot of different neighborhoods. And so um, we, we were one of the first ones on the apartment and the neighborhood trend. And that helped, uh, helped a ton. And then Colorado Food Truck Stops is, you know, kind of given us some leads for caterings through that. And uh, then, um, and then just trying to you know, limit. So we, we went down and we, we only send one person out in a truck each night. Now we don't send two. Uh, we've improved our online ordering system and gotten that out. Um, and so now instead, instead of paying two people each night, we just pay one. And then um, it's just trying to, trying to survive each night. You know, it's, um, you know, a lot, I, you know, we've become less selective on events. We've had to take some we'd never take before. We'd had to lower our prices um, as far as catering minimums go. And um, it's been it's been a struggle, but I'd say just kind of being open to the trend and the changes, and you know, lowering our minimum prices, and instead of saying you know it's only going to be a thousand dollars now, it's like well I'll, I'll I'll be up front and we'll send one employee to serve all fifty people. If you space them out over two hours, I'll charge you you know six fifty instead of a thousand, and then I don't have to pay a second person. I only have to pay one person, and we can come out ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's been tough for me too. My other question is, um, I have another one kind of related to what you just talked about. It seems like you had to reduce your labor costs. And so does that mean that's more hours for you running the business? And like, that's been my case. And how do you manage work-life balance when you're running Ford trucks and you might've had to reduce labor um, because of the, the pandemic? Yeah, so um, I, uh, I actually got married in March and I ended up working the next 30 days in the truck because that's when the pandemic hit. And so it was, um, it was do whatever it takes to just get to the other side. And um, I, was, I was working nonstop, kind of similar to like when we first started, it was, you know, 80 plus hours a, truck, a week in the truck, um, you know. And um, so I'm fortunate in the fact that I have multiple trucks. And so I do have a prep person that I'm able to pay to, you know, kind of take care of the food. And so I just have to go out and sell it. Um, but when I'm in the truck, um, I always have my phone on, I always have my email on um, and I'm always taking other calls and, 
and doing stuff and making the most of the excess time when people aren't walking up. And so, um, you know, we, we try and get to the, the spot at four instead of five. And I know we're going to be dead at four, but I beat traffic. So it's a shorter drive. Then I can sit there and I can answer emails. And if one or two people walk up to four or five, you know, um, it's just a bonus. It's something we're not counting on. Um, but I, I've been fortunate. I, I've got some strong employees who I trust a lot. Um, and I've just kind of had to open up my trust to them to, to do the job and, and just kind of take a step back and, and trust them that, you know, one person isn't going to kill me each night, but, you know, two probably would. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're welcome. And then uh, Shaylin Claypool had the next question. Hi, uh, my question was just, did you ever experience like any doubts when making um, pretty much all the decisions you made? And if you did, um, how did you deal with those and like get through those? I would say you, you never quit doubting yourself. Um, the, you know, it's even, even today, we constantly doubt, doubt ourselves. Um, do we make the right decision? Do people like our food? Um, did we, you know, do our best? Did, did the cater, um, the people we were catering for, were they happy? Um, that, that thought never goes away. Um, I think, you know, when, when you're not answering to someone above you and you're not standing behind someone's prod, product and you're standing behind your own, um, you'll, you'll always have that self-doubt. Um, but, you know, at, at the end of the day, I, I like the idea of sinking or swimming by my own, you know, faults. And so um, I'm just kind of come to a place where, you know, if it, if it ever does go under, you know, I, I gave everything I had. Um, and I, I'll have no regrets about trying or, or, you know, going out and taking a chance. I, I would have had more regrets just wondering what could have been than, than going out and failing. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's, that's just how I live. Nice. Thank you. And then uh, Jason Kesner is next. Oliver, why don't you answer, ask the question? Jason may have left us. Uh, what are your thoughts on Yelp? Uh, do you believe it benefits food businesses or is it a uh, detriment? I, I actually hate Yelp. Um, I have hated it since day one. Um, actually, I remember uh, Tony and I, when we set up that, that Yelp page and instantly, uh, I think within a month we regretted it. Um, it's, uh, you know, your most vocal people are your critics um, and, you know, going back to the self-doubt question, you know, if your self-doubt wasn't already hard enough, um, hearing about it from random strangers on the internet doesn't help your self-esteem. Um, so I, uh, I actually, I don't even read Yelp anymore. I just, uh, I don't pay attention to it. I haven't looked on it in six plus months um, and uh, I'm a lot happier for, for not paying attention to it. Yeah, I think starting out, it's especially, uh it's good not to look at Yelp because you'll probably have very few reviews and they're probably not going to be great. Um, we had some odd things happen too, where, you know, we had a few, maybe like one competing food truck at the time too. And, you know, some of the reviews didn't really make sense of even what people bought that day um, as far as food and, you know, doing some research ourselves to find out who the people were that were trying to review this. We think that even, like some of the competing trucks were writing bad reviews on there um, just to, I guess, bring us down. So it was kind of odd, so. Uh, Marco, Marco Bonilla is next. Good evening, everyone. Uh, real quick question, it has to do with the support structure. What does the support structure look like uh, for the food truck ecosystem in your area? A support structure as far as like the other trucks or the uh, both the city the city and the other trucks is there a food truck association does the city support you uh is there see I, i'm in boston so so forgive me for not yeah presenting myself i'm one of the professors here uh online professors at the university of denver uh city of boston has a website several websites that interlink food truck permits how to get a truck, how to build the truck. And there's a, there's a pretty strong support structure. I'm not sure if it's profitable still, right? I don't know any of the background information, 
but it looks like at least there's a, a support structure for you to build upon. And it, they tell you which sites to go to, how to do it on a private site versus public locations. And that's just the greater Boston area. Yeah, so um, I think the cities are opening up to it in Colorado. I think we're still a relatively new industry in Colorado um, and they're constantly changing. I was actually on the phone with the city of uh, Brighton, Colorado, which is the Northeast suburb of Denver. And they're trying to rewrite their food truck rules and regulations. And Denver is constantly changing theirs. Um, I would say for the most part, a lot of the cities are open to it and they're very um, helpful and they're trying to change with the times right now as food trucks continue to become more and more um, popular in, in Colorado. Um, that they are, they are more open to it. Um, I'd say, you know, when we first started five years ago, um, it was hard to figure out where you can go, how to work. Um, and uh, your biggest thing is, is your, your friends in the business. So um, from support, I'd say the, the other trucks are worth way more, um, you know, than, than trying to be confrontational and not offer advice and not help them. Um, and so the trucks that we parked with at our commissary, you know, they could became some of my good friends and we would turn into trading, uh, trading spots. So one person would get into a location and then they'd recommend the other trucks in the yard. And next thing you know, the seven or eight of us, we, we were their schedule. Um, and then, you know, as we added one, we would bring them in. And so um, the, the trucks in Denver, fortunately for the most part, I would say most of us are pretty open to helping each other and, and wanting to see others succeed. Um, the ones who have been more confrontational um, probably have not lasted as long as the ones who are more working together. Um, and it's, uh, it's more about, you know, teaming up to, to do stuff because the best events always have more than one truck. And so your friends give you, you know, just as much, if not more leads than you're able to give yourself. So it's the, it's the other trucks that are much more important to be friends with than, than anything else. Scorpio Rogers is next. I, sorry, I apologize. I, I came a little late. I was actually uh, snow blowing snow. I'm in New York, so <laughs> I came in from blowing snow. Uh, so super quick, I, I'm sure you went over this. Why a food truck? Why mac and cheese? And then can you tell me a little bit about your educational background? What was your major? When did you graduate? That's, that's sort of good stuff. And then tell me how your education helped you. Like, did you take business classes? Did they help? That's it. Yeah, so it was a, we chose a food truck because it's a little cheaper than a restaurant. Um, I was 25 at the time, um, you know, even with uh, two partners who had a permanent income or outside income, we still could not get approved for a restaurant loan. Um, it was going to cost uh, estimated at three, 350000 plus for a food truck we could start for under fifty at the time. Um, you know, the why mac and cheese? Um, we just thought it was catchy. Uh, we, you know, I was at a place in Copper Mountain, Colorado. Um, and there was a, there was a restaurant there. They had four different versions of mac and cheese. And I thought, you know, if Chipotle could take the burrito out of the Mexican restaurant and build a concept around it, why couldn't someone take mac and cheese out of, you know, an American restaurant and build a concept around that? Um, and so that was kind of where the mac and cheese came from. Um, my degree was in hospitality management at Iowa State. I would say, um, as far as operating a restaurant, I did not have any, um, takeaway experience for them. Uh, there, their experience for me was more in food safety. So going in, I kind of already knew the health code and that was, that was my only experience I had. It was, so I knew, you know, time temperature. I knew how the, you know, you're supposed to organize your refrigerator with your produce at the top and your raw meats and vegetables at the bottom, or your raw meats at the bottom, your raw vegetables at the top. Um, but that would be about all I knew going into the food trucks as far as um, what my education had, had given me. Um, I wish I would have taken more finance classes. I wish I had a better of understanding of accounting at the time uh, because, and I wish I knew more about human resources because at the end of the day, you know, a lawyer is expensive, an HR firm is expensive, and you have to wear the hats of HR, uh, lawyer, accounting, and, uh, and everything and, and figure all that out. So um, I just, I wish that's the stuff I would have known better at the time. Great, thank you. Uh, Kim Lambu, he has another question. Um, hi again, Dave. Yep. Uh, my question is, what do you envision for the future of food trucks here in Denver after COVID uh, numbers go, go down to like safer levels? Um, do you think 
food trucks are going to um, continue to stick with neighborhoods or, you know, go back to breweries? Like, what do you, what do you see, like how it trending after, after things kind of go back to safer levels? Yeah. So um, it actually kind of sped up the process that I was kind of already wanting to be on anyway. Um, I've always thought that the food truck brewery concept, con concept is a failed relationship. Um, you're just an asset to the brewery, but the brewery doesn't truly really care about the food truck at the end of the night. So I've always been trying to get out of them. Um, and, you know, it's to them, it's, it's their co customers and you're, you know, you just don't mean a whole lot. So I, I do think the neighborhoods are going to continue to get better and stronger. I think more and more neighborhoods will add food trucks. I think the neighborhoods will continue to be more year round than just uh, May through October. I'm a little nervous. I don't, I don't know if the festivals will come back in the same capacity they were before. Um, I, I do think, you know, with mac and noodles and mac and cheese, we were big into the schools of Colorado. Um, so I think, I think those will come, come back, um, but I, I don't foresee the office buildings that we all went to for lunches and the big, you know, clients like um, Arrow or Lockheed Martin. I don't foresee them, you know, even while they're able to have, uh, a lot of people in person. I don't think those numbers will ever be the same in the office buildings. And, and I think that uh, will, will decline. It'll be a much more um, neighborhoods and apartment complexes in the future. Thank you. You're welcome. And those are all the questions in the chat. Thanks, Oliver. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I see we live out in Golden and I'm, I'm seeing a lot more postings of, hey, there's a food truck on 64th and 93 and they'll be there tonight between five and eight. And if you don't feel like cooking, come come out there. And which I think is a wonderful idea and a, and a great opportunity. Yeah, I think next door and Facebook are by far your biggest friends right now in, in food trucking and knowing someone in the area to post for you because I mean, it will, it'll make or break your night just by who you know in the neighborhood. Yeah, that, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. Um, David and Tony, I, I really appreciate your time tonight. You, you guys uh, dropped a lot of knowledge and something around a, a topic that I was not familiar with. And I, I appreciate you being so willing to share your time, especially since you just had a, a, young, a young baby, so, uh, or a baby. So uh, we really appreciate that. If everybody would just unmute their mics and give every uh, Dave and Tony a big round of applause, I'd appreciate it. And uh, you know, just th thank you all for uh, for coming. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. yeah thanks, everyone. Any, anytime. And uh, that concludes tonight. And everybody, uh, thanks for coming tonight. Be safe and be well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.